Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sandro Rizzoli, who uh, spoke yesterday, and today we'll be talking about adrenaline and the uh, role of beta blockers in traumatic brain injury. Do you want it in Portuguese? Oh, it's okay. English. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Great. Good morning. Uh, once again, I want to thank Dr. Notrika, uh, Dr. Salvino, Perry, Ball, for the honor to be invited to come here. So the, answer, the question I, I want to answer in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is, should we consider interfering with a natural response that has kept our species alive for thousands of years? Should we? Right? Should we play around with a sympathetic response? So my big disclosure here is that everything I'm going to talk to you now is part of Dr. Luis Teodoro's thesis. Right? Luis Teodoro was one of my uh, graduate students. He's now working at Sunnybrook, and this is his thesis work. So let's talk a little bit about adrenaline and noradrenaline. Uh, I keep on imagining myself going across the street, and I see a bus coming towards me. Right? So even before that bus hits me. <clears throat> I can assure you that I will have a sympathetic storm. There will be adrenaline and noradrenaline being released throughout my body. And the way that happens, and even after I'm hit by the bus, well, there will still be a massive release of catecholamines. And why does our body do that? It's survival. It's the body getting ready to give you a chance of surviving that trauma that is happening right now. So it's the fight and flight response, and catecholamines cause a massive neurological, endocrine, immune, inflammatory mobilization. They want me to survive. But then if we think well, the responses caused by catecholamines, uh, you can see where too much of a good thing could be harmful. So catecholamines increase the heart and the brain oxygen demand. It causes more CO2 production. It causes inflammation. It causes metabol uh, hypermetabolism. And we even know that certain patients, when they have a head injury, they actually have ischemic changes in their heart. They have cardiac dysfunction. That's well described, as well as neurogenic pulmonary edema caused just by the head injury. So I was interested in the topic. I said, well, what's out there about catecholamines and head injury? And, uh, and to my surprise, there's not much. In fact, I was looking for a map of the catecholamine receptors in the brain, and I couldn't find it. I thought this would be something that probably was done in the 1970s or something, and, and I couldn't find it. And actually, there are very few studies on catecholamines and head injury. And these are one of the best ones, the three best ones, all published in the 80s and 90s. And basically what they saw was that they don't tell you when they measure the catecholamines. There's not much description about the patients themselves, but there is, looks like that if the more severe head injury patients had more catecholamines by the time they measured, and they stayed longer in the hospital and they died more. And, uh, Hamil in 1987 suggested probably catecholamines could be a good biomarker. You could tell who are the patients who are going to survive or not. And Wolf associated catecholamine surge with outcome after head injury. So just very briefly talking about catecholamines themselves. So the epinephrine is basically reflects 
know, the release of catecholamine from the adrenomedulla, while norepinephrine uh, is the spillover of catecholamines from the neuron terminals. They basically mess up with a few receptors abundant in the body, like uh, beta-1 receptors, particularly in the heart, where they increase the chronotropism, increase the inotropism, increase stroke volume in the heart. And then they also cause, uh, if they stimulate beta-2 receptors, cause bronchodilatation. So think of that, right? If you're going to give beta blockers to these patients, it can cause bronchoconstriction on someone who may already be hypoxemic. And if they stimulate beta-3 receptors, they cause hypermetabolism. Well, you know all this, right? You remember physiology? No first year of medical school, that's it. And there's also alpha receptors, and uh, alpha receptors cause vasoconstriction and also contracts your GI sphincters. I always find that very interesting. Um, the fact is that you can manipulate this response by giving patients beta blockers or even alpha agonists that we use, and we know that these medications, they have a central effect. So my interest was to study catecholamines in head injuries. And, and that's, I find very interesting that many speakers take propanolol before going to, to, to debates, right? Because you take propanolol because then your heart rate cools down, you don't sweat, you look much more in control. So beta blockers do have a central effect. And the question I had was, is there any role for giving beta blockers to treat patients with head injury? Is that protective or not? But then we had to answer before, what are we treating? Treating what? What is a sympathetic response? And this was Luis, uh, and this, oh, I forgot this. So there are also some of the effects of beta blockers. There is some evidence that beta blockers, in fact, in head injury, experimental models, reduce the cerebral perfusion. Oh, oh, actually, they increase the cerebral perfusion, and they reduce the hypoxemia of the brain. And actually, many studies show that patients who are taking beta blocker and suffer head injury, they have a better chance of surviving. So this was the study that we did, we call it COMA, and this was a multi-center study, two, studies, two hospitals in Toronto, and then later on, Kenji and Abba joined us on this study. This was just an observational study, and as I said, we're just trying to study what happens to catecholamines after you suffer a head injury. The goal here was to study patients with isolated head injury. So we had to get patients who had only injury to the brain itself, and they, so that we, we went by Glasgow, because we want these patients as early as possible. So we only went by Glasgow. So Glasgow below, below 12 were included. And we didn't want patients with any other body injury. So they have to have a low AIS in the other regions of the body. And then we simply collect blood at four time points in the first 24 hours. We send away patients... Uh, who got to us too late, we want patients as early as possible, and then we got sample, uh, blood samples in the first 24 hours, and our outcome was GOSC, Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended at six months. And if you remember the GOSC, it's a scale that goes from one to eight. So one, you're dead, eight, you're applying to work with Dr. Mattox in, uh, in, uh, in Dallas, or you're playing piano, or you're running for president, or something like that. So that's, that's the range of the scale, so that's a, a good way to assess neurological outcome. So we got the three hospitals to start enrolling patients for us, and uh, our goal was to have about 200 patients. We got 200 patients, but then we had to exclude a few patients, uh, and then we end up with 181 patients. And here are some of the results. This is just a demographic, so here nothing major. You're going to see there are three columns here. The yellow column is the unfavorable outcome. Unfavorable outcome is a high GOSC at six months. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, low GOSC, a patient who either died or had a poor neurological recovery. So who, and the favorable ones, they have a high GOSC, they have a good neurological recovery at six months. So what we see is the patients who have unfavorable outcome, the usual stuff that we wait, they were older when they had the head injury, they had a higher ISS, they have a lower GCS, as you'd expect, they have more anatomical brain injury as measured by the AIS, they had more brain injury as measured by the CT scan, 
and the Marshall score, and, they, and more patients with a poor outcome had hypotension. We know all those things are bad prognosticators, and that's what we found on our population. We look at the lab, because we know coagulopathy, and again, I can't do a single study without looking into coagulopathy, so of course I had to look into that, and actually, the patients who had unfavorable outcome had also worse lab. But more importantly, they have, more of them had abnormal troponins, and more of them had ECG changes, showing that when you have a head injury, you do have a massive release of catecholamines, and your heart suffers. Actually, I was very interested that to doing echo on these patients and see how the cardiac function it is. I'll bet that a lot of them would have significant cardiac dysfunction because of so much adrenaline and noradrenaline that they release. And also the patients that had worse, worsening of the CT scan also had a worse outcome. And here's the final one as, uh, on the demographics, is that mortality was around 30%. So 52 patients died while in the hospital. All of them died either of their head injury or died from withdrawal or life support. And uh, actually, only two more patients died after they left the hospital. So we had 181 patients included, and we have 179 patients that we met again at six months. So we didn't miss a single patient in the six-month follow-up. Okay. So this is, these are the observations that we made on this study, right? So the red column is norepi, the pink column is epi. And this is a timeline. So it's obvious. And, and the last two columns are healthy volunteers. Those are normal levels. Right? So if you compare the first column with the last column, you can see that the patients when they arrived, they had a huge level of catecholamines on their blood, both epi and norepi, some, something like five to 20 times higher than you would observe on a normal one. And then what happened over time is that these levels, they dropped. And that for me is very important because that's already telling us if we have to intervene, when would be the best time to intervene? And actually, when we started looking at outcome, we saw was the peak value that had more correlation, was more associated with poor outcome than actually the variation over time. So I suspect that if you want to intervene, the earlier the better. Then we look if there was an association between levels of catecholamine and severity of the head injury. This has been shown before, and we just find exactly what people showed before. So again, red column, nor epi, pink column, epi, severe TBI according to GCS, so very low GCS, GCS below eight, and then GCS above eight, what we found was that the, the patients who had more severe head injury, they have also higher levels of epi and norepi. So there's a dose response here. And if we the, uh, classify the severity of the head, head injury according to the anatomical damage caused to the brain, we saw the same thing, more, more higher release of epi and norepi on these patients than the patients who had less head injury. And I really apologize for this slide because it may make no sense, but basically what it is, this is Marshall's score, and Marshall's score goes one to four according to edema. So one's a little bit of edema, Marshall four is a lot of edema in the brain, and then five and six are hematomas in the brain. So it's a weird scale, it's not a you can think of a continuous scale. So think about one to four, that's the amount of edema in the brain, and what you can see here on this slide is that as you go from Marshall 1 to Marshall 4, less edema to more edema, you have less release of epi nor epi and much, much more release of epi and nor epi in the patients who have more brain edema. And the question here is, who comes first? Is the brain edema who caused the, the huge release or is the huge release of catecholamines that actually cause more harm to the brain? And this is the outcome, and this is the, the most important slide, is that what we saw was that there was a, a clear association between the level, the peak level of epi and or epi release and how these patients did six months later. If they were dead, if they were in a vegetative state, or if they were playing piano. And there was a clear association between the levels of epi and nor epi with outcome. 
So, and these are just uh, some slides to emphasize the point. And then we also look at the association of levels of epi and epi with other complications such as multiple organ dysfunction, sepsis, elevated ICP, and was associated with them all. So I, I say what we, this study showed is that there is an association, clear association, between the level of epi nor epi release and how well this patient is going to do. So you have two things that you can come up out of this. Number one is, is this the cause of the poor outcome? Higher levels of epi nor epi are the ones who cause these patients to have a bad outcome. If that's the case, it would be justifiable to start studying the use of beta blockers to interfere with this response, to basically alleviate this response. The other conclusion they may say, say no, you didn't prove causality, and you're right, we didn't. Maybe this is just a biomarker. Maybe this one is just telling you who's going to do poorly and who's not going to do poorly. And we did a lot of statistical tests to look epi and or epi as biomarkers. And I tell you, they added very little to the scores that already exist for you to tell if your patient with head injury is going to do well or not. And we try also to find a cutoff level and we couldn't find. So basically, this is the conclusion of our study. So what we found out was that the level of epi and or epi in patients with head injury is significantly higher as we would expect from compared to normal uh, uh, healthy volunteers and this value drops over time so there's a time uh, line, there's a time response uh, for these patients. The level of epi nor epi are associated with the outcome and uh, are associated also with how severe the head injury is. The question is, is this just a marker of severity of the disease, or is this the cause? I would say that there's a lot of other evidence suggesting that probably too much of a good thing, too much, an overwhelming response initially could be responsible, at least in part, for the outcome of these patients. So then the conclusion of our study is that it would be justifiable to actually look into this probability and considering a study where you give actually better blocker to treat your patients. But I will emphasize again, evidence to support a study in a protected environment, because I think that just giving a better blockers outside that would be dangerous and we would be taking away a response that, as I said, is responsible for survival of our species for thousands of years. So once again, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandro. Uh, any questions? From the uh, audience here, yes. Dr. Rubiano. Andres Rubiano, Colombia. Uh, doctor, we are doing some studies right now evaluating glucose level in severe TBI. And we found that uh, in some of the patterns of the lesion, uh, specifically for subarachnoidal hemorrhage, uh, traumatic subarachnoidal hemorrhage, we found also uh, difference in glucose levels for uh, associated to severity and, and severity of the image. So my question is, did you measure subarachnoidal hemorrhage in the patterns of these patients related to uh, catecholamine levels? Could you just repeat the, the question again? Uh, I'm sorry. Did you have the Marshall score, okay. and did you measure the over than the uh, than the Marshall score the presence or not of subarachnoidal hemorrhage uh, in these patients? Because some, some theory that we are trying to, to evaluate is that maybe uh, all this dysfunction in glucose is also associated to hypoperfusion of the midline and uh, hypothalamus area. Yeah. So maybe it can be something related to that. So one way of difference that if, if you have patient that does not have like midline shift or yeah. cisterns compression but have subarachnoidal hemorrhage, uh, it will be also related to vasospasm and hypoperfusion in midline. So, did you measure uh, subarachnoidal hemorrhage in these patients? Sure. Okay. So, uh, so, the first thing, just, just to make sure that uh, when you measure uh, hemorrhage, it's very clear that these patients didn't have bleeding outside the brain, right? They, they were not hypotensive. They were again, only isolated head injury. Patients had nothing. They were excluded if they had anything else, if they were hypotensive and so on, but for bleeding. But I think you mean bleeding in the brain. So we tried to make an association between the, even the location of the contusion and the level of, of adrenaline, and we could not. 
maybe because our sample is, would be small for that. What we found was an association with edema. It was clearly the more diffuse the edema, the more severe the edema, then was associated with, with adrenaline and or adrenaline, but not contusion or extra actual hematomas. We didn't find that correlation. Yeah. Dr. Haas. Hi, Alex Mihalovich from Victoria. Hi, Sandro. Hi Great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering how your findings, I know they're just preliminary, but translate into guidance with exogenous administration of norepinephrine to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure, which is all I can think about while I'm listening to you is how much uh -huh. I give to do that. That's, that's, uh, that's one. So again, we only included patients that had not received any catecholamines before we start measuring it. Some of them actually had to receive catecholamines after, usually norepi. Um, but that's an excellent question that I don't know the answer. I'll tell you, there's a lot of patients, that a lot of people who are studying CPR, right? And they are saying that that thing of giving epi during CPR is the worst thing you can do for someone with CPR. You give epi for them, and uh, you have more patients that live long enough, they have cardiac arrest, live long enough to get to the hospital. But when you look how many patients leave the hospital alive, you find that the patient who got epi have no advantage to that. And there are some studies showing that when you use epi to do CPR, chest compressions, you decrease the perfusion to the brain. They're beautiful angi angiograms and so on. So actually, I don't know, right? Uh, the answer is I don't know, but I wonder if by giving uh, catecholamines to certain patients who are not worsening their head injury, decreasing the, the blood, the cerebral perfusion pressure, increasing brain edema by doing that. On the other hand, we know blood pressure is essential for the brain, right? You have to maintain perfusion to the brain. That's the challenge of dealing with this. So, thank you for the question. One.